continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and uh, if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, we're beginning a new chapter, we've been studying, learning so much. I mean, you know, I've read the book of Hebrews many times and studied through it, but there's nothing like teaching it to learn it. I, I've told you this many times, if you want to learn the Bible, volunteer to do a, a Bible study, uh, whether in the, the uh, uh, assisted living or a small group, and boy, when you teach it, I've got to stand before people and explain this. I better know it. And it just makes you study like you never would study. You know, you ever just read through the Bible and skip over things? You won't do that if you're going to be teaching it. So anyway, we're in, <coughs> we're in Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm calling today's message Sac Sacred Shadows. Uh, we've been learning how much greater Jesus Christ is than all of the people, all the personages of the Old Testament than the Old Covenant. We saw that the, the book of Hebrews is actually known for or as the greater than book. Jesus is greater than. And you name all the people, all the greats of the Old Testament, Jesus is greater than them. All, and it's all, we're always comparing Jesus to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And we've seen that the, the New Covenant is far superior than the Old Covenant. Uh, and, and to the point that the Law of Moses and the activities of the temple worship are actually in the book of Hebrews. It's actually called just a shadow, just a dim preview. Let me read that to you. That's, we haven't even got the Hebrews 10 yet, but I like to keep looking ahead at it. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. So if all you're doing is focusing on the Old Testament, uh, you'll, you'll be missing out because I think I put it in your shepherd to sheep in the bulletin. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So we learn so much as we study the book of Hebrews because it keeps looking back and showing us this meant that. And you know, sadly, we Christians, we live in kind of, we're citizens of two worlds. The shadow world, this world, and the real world yet to come, we're looking forward to entering into. And for the time being, we're living in this temporary physical body. It's governed by physical laws and in a specific geographical location. And it's all temporary, but it's still all very real, right? You, you know that when you hit your finger with a hammer or something, you, it's real. It's not just a, a movie or, or, or a dream. And, but there are spiritual realities and truths. And there are physical realities and truths. And because of the contrasting dichotomy of us living and being citizens of two worlds, we've got to learn to live by faith. And so the book of Hebrews is helping us with this because as a, hold on. I asked for a mute button because I, I do that now and then. Uh, uh, but God always gives us people types and pictures and images to help us grasp the, the unseen, to help us grasp the spiritual world. And that's what we're going to look at more today as we look at chapter 9 of Hebrews. Father, we ask that as we look into this book, that you'd speak to us what we need to hear. Lord, you know everybody in here intimately. You know where we come from. You know what we struggle with. You know what we're dealing with right before our face right now. And Lord, we ask that you give us what we need for the moment. Give, give us what we need today as we look at your word and look to Jesus. Speak into our hearts. Give us strength to live as we ought. And so we give you this time. We pray you fill us with your spirit. We need you, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start right out with a fill-in. You know, those of you who've been with us, you know that we use these fill-ins for the small groups. I know some people who don't make it to the small groups, they still use the fill-ins uh, just to study at home on their own. So here's your first fill-in. The New Testament teaches us that God is not worshipped today in temples made with hands. Now you think, well, why are you starting there? Because that's what the book of Hebrews is trying to get across to you. It's not about that physical temple. Uh, as a matter of fact, Stephen in the, uh, in the book of Acts, I, I put the reference in your fill-ins, Acts chapter 7, verse 46 through 50, where Stephen's given the whole history of Israel before he got martyred. He was the first martyr. And he, one of the things he proclaimed 
is that God is not worshipped with temples made with hands. Because that's the big deal. People just go, where's the holy place? We've got to go to the holy place, you know. You know what, if any place is a holy place, it's supposed to be you and me. The Bible says, don't you know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Therefore, we should be living like a holy place, right? If we only get that right, it's not like we're on good behavior when we're going to church. We're in good behavior all the time because we are the church, okay? I stopped in the middle of the fill-in. Sometimes I interrupt myself. Okay, the next part of the fill-in says, there is no special place on earth where God specifically dwells. You know, I, I, let me tell you something. I've been to the Holy Land. It's not so holy, okay? If you've been to the Holy Land, it's filled, even to this day, with idolatry and weird stuff. If you want to buy a nice zodiac and all, all kinds of weird idol, idols, go to the Holy Land and go to the gift shops. It's all there. It's not so holy right now, okay? Hopefully uh, that will change soon. But I also gave you uh, more verses, and this is for you to look up, maybe in the growth groups you'll look these up as well, from Isaiah and John chapter 4 about where God dwells. You could go deeper in that. Now we may call, you know, a church the house of God. He doesn't really live there. He lives in our hearts. He lives in us. And matter of fact, I, I've been a pastor for enough years now. Uh, I think it's coming up on 38 years. And every church I've been a part of, uh, I, I had the privilege to go into that building when there was no service going on. When the lights are off. And it's empty. And you hear crickets. It's not like glowing. It's like... It's, you know what makes the place holy? When you guys are there. When the, when the church gathers. And then he says, wherever two or three are gathered my name, there I am in the midst. So that's what makes the place holy. Because I believe me, I've been to some of the greatest churches. And I've been there when there's people. And I've been there when there's no people. And it's nothing without you guys. The church is the people, okay? Just keep that in mind. Now, Hebrews 9 presents detailed contrasts for us between the old covenant, specifically the, the tabernacle, and the new covenant. We're going to look at the tabernacle today in depth. Um, and and the, the, there's the new heavenly sanctuary in heaven that's, the, the tabernacle was just images, was a, a dim picture of. And as we study these contracts, contracts, contrasts, we'll see that um, it makes it very clear the superiority of the heavenly tabernacle compared to the earthly tabernacle. Now we left off in Hebrews chapter 8, the last verse, let's look at it, let's pick up there and run right into chapter 9. Uh, Hebrews 8, 13 says, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And I told you guys that this was just about six years before uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, before 70 AD when the Romans sacked Jerusalem and the temple burnt down. And boy, how true this is. It's ready to be finally wiped away because the new has come and the old is not needed anymore. He goes on, remember there's no chapter heading, so he goes on to say, then indeed... Even the first covenant had ordinances and divine service uh, for the earthly sanctuary. Now, the old covenant services really were centered and focused more around the earthly, and, and that sanctuary, or the original one, was a tabernacle. And, and all that was just a mere shadow or a dim type of the heavenly. Matter of fact, when, when God told Moses to build the the tabernacle and we looked at this in chapter 8 he says be careful to make it exactly as I have told you because it was all images and pictures of the heavenly tabernacle so as we look at from verse 2 through 8 we're going to look at the original tabernacle I even have some actual photographs no they're drawings uh, don't you wish I mean I'm a, I hope that when we get to heaven um, and of course when you get to heaven who wants to look at pictures right I used to say, I want them to play the tape. Tape? <laughs> I want them to play the video so that we could watch some of these things. The parting of the Red Sea and the, the, the smoke on the mountain and all the different things. But you know what? When you're standing there in the presence, of, yeah, not standing. When you're on your knees before the Almighty God, 
you probably won't be at wishing you had videos to look at or, or images or pictures because <clears throat> nothing could compare to the presence of God. Amen. Sometimes I think about um, <clears throat> I, 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 that we, we probably should when we pray, you know, people like images and pictures and sometimes people pray in front of pictures or statues. For me, I would love to just have a giant mural of the universe in high definition from that new web telescope. Have you seen some of those pictures? And you realize the person that you're talking to created all that. Sometimes we think, oh, God is just my little buddy. Oh, he's not much more than your little buddy. He's the, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heavens and earth. And, and if we only grasped what he was capable of, what he's done, we'd, we wouldn't talk to him like our little buddy. We say, oh, Lord God Almighty, creator of heavens and earth. And yet he has stooped low for us. And we'll see that in Hebrews chapter 9. He stoops low that he became a man. Matter of fact, you want to see, we, we can't picture a God who created all these things. So we get little pictures of Jesus. But we don't have pictures. We don't, have, we don't know what he looks like. But you know what? God knew we needed something or someone to relate to that we could connect with him. And he sent us Jesus. So instead of looking at the web telescope pictures, look to Jesus, because he's our connection with God. It won't overwhelm you as much anyway. Anyway, I got off on that. Listen, by the time we get to verse 9, we're going to see, so I'm going to give you a sneak preview, that we're told that everything in the temple and everything of the Old Covenant was symbolic. It was, matter of fact, the word symbolic in verse 9, it's a, the Greek word is parabole. Does that sound like a word you know? Parable. And so all the things that we see in the temple and the furniture and the priest and their functions, it was all a parable of the real, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I, I love it, okay? So let's begin now looking at, from verse 2. We'll look at some of the details. First, the big picture. Verse 2 says, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, uh, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now, I, I do, I'm doing my best to find. Sometimes the web has better pictures than other times. And there's a, a picture I want you to get, but this is just one. I've got a few different ones, so there's better ones too. But this tabernacle was, this was just a tent, but it was the center place, it was the focal point of worship in the Old Testament. And as you look at it, try to picture, it was 45 feet long, it was 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high, and it was divided into two rooms. The larger room, the first part, which is mentioned in verse 2, was 15 feet by 30 feet. And it was called the holy place. Now think about it. This was the center of worship. It could fit in this gymnasium. I mean, we, they could set the whole thing up right here. Okay? And, and it, it was the holy place, the first part of it. Now behind the second veil was a smaller room. And it was 15 by 15. It was a cube. 15 by 15. And it was called the holy of holies. Or in the text here, it's called the holiest of all. And we've got to get it through our heads that worship in the Old Covenant was so much more different than it is today. Because today we all go to church. We all see each other and we worship God as if He's right here in our midst because He is. In this time, especially in the original tabernacle and then later the temple, only the priests could go in. Only the priests, after much training and years of waiting, uh, would, could go into the first part and then the second part only the high priest could go in. Very limited access to church in those days, right? And so in contrast to the tabernacle in heaven all who will, all who will come to Jesus Christ could enter into his presence. We'll all be there if we come through Jesus Christ. So a big difference but it's a, it's a dim shadow of what's in heaven. So let's take a look at some of the furniture, starting with verse 2. But re remember, these are copies of things in heaven. As a matter of fact, uh, Hebrews 9.23 says this in the New Living. The tabernacle and everything in it 
were copies of things in heaven. Now it's not exact copy, exact size, and made of this. It's it's a parable. It's, it's a dim shadow, so that you could get an idea of the spiritual. Okay, and each each piece of furniture had its own special meaning. So I want to go through some of the pieces of furniture with you, and we'll see what like kind of what might that mean okay first and I read it in verse 2 and 3 some of the, uh, the the furnishings there's a lampstand and this lampstand you could find various pictures and, and this is the matter of fact as I, after I found this I thought I don't think that's Hebrew I don't know what language that is <laughs> it tells me but but this lampstand this is the, the best I think probably one of the most accurate pictures I could find and it stood in the first part the holy place and it is a, is a seven-branched golden candlestick. And uh, those of you in the small groups, I send my notes that you could look up. Uh, I've got references where you could read about this candlestick in the Old Testament. It was made of pure gold. Must have been pretty heavy. Seven-branched gold, uh, golden candlestick. And it, was, it provided the only light for the sanctuary. You go in there, I mean, there was thick veils and thick curtains. It was badger skin coverings over this tabernacle. When you go in, it would have been pitch dark except for this seven-branched golden candlestick. And the light that was produced from it, the flames were kept by burning wicks fed by oil, not candlesticks as you might picture today. It wasn't little candlesticks. It was, it was wicks that kept burning through a, a supply of oil. And since there were no windows in the tabernacle, the lampstand provided much needed light for the priest uh, to minister in that place. So, something else about the, the uh, as we think about that candlestick, there is typology and symbol in several, on several levels here. First of all, the nation Israel was actually supposed to be light to the Gentiles. In Isaiah 42, 6 and Isaiah 49, 6, God tells his people, I want you to be a light to the Gentiles. And so we'll start there, but more than that, we who know Jesus in the New Testament, we know Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And he who follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so Jesus is the light of the world. And we'll talk a little bit more about that candlestick and Jesus in a second. But you know, as we follow through on this thought, and, and those of you who want to t are taking notes, you might want to write down Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, because we're told that believers, every believer, is supposed to shine as a light in a dark world. That's what God's called us to do. And by the time we get to the book of Revelation, which we've already taught through that, so it'll be a while before we come back around and go through the book of Revelation, we see Jesus in the heavenly tabernacle, in the real deal, standing in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. And the Bible tells us that those seven golden candlesticks represented us, the church. And if you want to read the first uh, four chapters of the book of Revelation, you'll see Jesus had some positive and some negative things to say to the church. Some encouragement and some rebuke. I've done a whole study on that. And matter of fact, our men and our men's group has been going through Jesus speaking to the churches of Revelation. So much we could learn through that. But Jesus walks among the seven golden candlesticks. He walks among us, and that's in the real sanctuary, what's going on. Remember, in the tabernacle, it's all symbolic. It's all parabole. It's a parable, okay? The next piece of furniture I want to point out to you is the table, and it's actually called the table of showbread. And this table was made of acacia wood. It was covered with gold, his gold inlaid, and it was three feet long by a one and a half feet wide, and it was two feet three inches high and what this this table is used for was to store 12 loaves of showbread and in a, back in those days they, they used bread without leaven so they were like flat pancake uh, looking bread I think give you an idea that's kind of a dark picture I found there but it is what it is um, and so the these each of these loaves represented a tribe of Israel and it was called the bread of the, the presence that that the tribes of Israel were ever before the presence of God. And every Sabbath, once a week, the, the priest 
would remove the old loaves and they'd put fresh loaves in there. And then the priests alone were allowed to eat of the, uh, the loaves. As a week old bread, I guess it would be okay. And, and so these loaves were called the bread of, of presence. And it was a reminder of God's presence among the children of Israel, uh, sustaining and encompassing the 12 tribes of Israel. And today we could also look at it as, isn't Jesus called the bread of life? Jesus is the bread of life. He's the one who sustains and keeps us. And he's given for the life of the world. Now back then, only the priests could eat of the bread of the presence. But today, every believer could partake of the bread of life. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was instituting the new covenant, remember at the Last Supper, when he was changing, mysteriously changing the meaning of the symbolism of the Passover meal, this will now mean that, and this will now mean this. He says, he held the cup that used to be the, the cup of redemption, and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. He took the bread that, that had all kinds of meaning in, in, in the Old Testament, but he changed it. He goes, now it's pointing to me. He took the bread and says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And so every time we have communion, I think we did, we did do that last week, we had communion. Every time we have communion, we're remembering Jesus is the bread of life. We're remembering that he was broken for all mankind, that all who will could come freely and partake. He says, take and eat. Not just the priest, not just exclusive little club, and only one man gets to go into the Holy of Holies. Everything has changed because that was just a dim image of the new picture, of the new covenant, which, what did we look at last week? It's a better covenant with better promises, okay? Now, in verse 2, at the last part of it, it says, uh, this, it says the, the the stand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And so we're told that this whole first part is called the sanctuary. It's funny, when we go to church, at least all of my life growing up in Calvary chapels, uh, whenever I went to church, they'd say, I'll see you in the sanctuary. This was the sanctuary, the place where we all go into the sanctuary. Well, this was called the sanctuary, the first part of it. And it, re <clears throat> it refers to the what we call the holy place. Now, there was this veil, this thick curtain that separated the first part from the holiest of all or the holy of holies and some estimate that this curtain could have been woven to be somewhere around 10 inches or more heavy curtain thick curtain the wind didn't blow this curtain you weren't peeking on the other side of this curtain unless you intentionally were allowed to go through it it was a it was representing the the separation between the holiest of all God the Father and, and his people, even the priests couldn't, only the high priest, once a year. Now, I want to do a spoiler alert. I wasn't, I don't know where this is in my notes, but I don't know if you're aware. But when Jesus died on the cross, and he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and he shed his blood for you and I, the sacrifice on that day, he cried out, it is finished. And that 10-inch veil that separated the holiest of all from the holy place was torn. No man could do that. And it was torn from top to bottom. God did it. God said, no more. No more veil. No more separation. Because Jesus paid the price so that man could have fellowship with God. Wonderful picture. Now, I, I have visited some real fancy churches. Some of them actually have veils up. Matter of fact, when me and my friend... Uh, uh, Matt Slick, when, when they rededicated the, the um, I think it was the Boise uh, Temple, the LDS Church, and they wanted us to see how beautiful it was, and we went to the holy place, and, the, and so they said, you guys have any questions? And Matt says, yeah, how come the veil's up? Didn't, and he'll tell, didn't God tear that veil? It was torn down? It was like, well, let me go get somebody to answer that question. You know, <laughs> you know how it goes. But he, he's troubled. That's why I took him with me when I was going to go on the tour. I, I knew he'd have some good questions. My question was, why do we even need temples? Because everything we're reading in the New Testament, they, they didn't use temples anymore. And, and nowhere in the New Testament are we told to build temples. The only ones that were there were 
the Jewish temples, and it was temporary, and it was about to be destroyed in 70 AD because of what we're reading in Hebrews, that it was temporary and weak and, and meagerly, and so now we have the real deal, access to God. Okay, getting sidetracked again. Listen, there was another piece of furniture, and it was called <clears throat> the Golden Altar of Incense. Now, this golden altar of incense was also made incense. Did I say incest? You know, that incest me. Did it? Yeah. Oh, thanks. If I ever get lost, I could, I could count on LG to keep me going. Thanks, LG. Okay. <laughs> so, the golden altar of incense. Uh, it, it was also made of acacia wood. It was covered with gold. And it was one and a half feet square. And then it was on a stand, so it was three feet high. And it stood right before the veil to enter into the most holy place. Right at that veil of the Holy of Holies. Probably some of the incense might even make it into the Holy of Holies. I'm not sure. I wasn't there. But this golden altar was in the holy place, almost guarding the way to the Holy of Holies. And we know that, this, that incense in the Old Testament always spoke of prayer rising up before God. And so it was before you could go into the most holy place, you've got to have intercession. You've got to have prayer going up. And then the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take coals from this altar of incense and he'd burn it in, he'd bring those coals into the most holy place. Now, in my study, I'm finding a little bit of a controversy. Because some believe that the priest would actually take the, the whole altar of incense and roll it in there. I don't know. It looked like it might be a little awkward. I wouldn't want to knock it over, you know. Others believe that <coughs> there was a censer. And that's what we're talking about as we continue to read. I think in verse 4 it says a golden censer. So some believe that the coals were taken from the altar of incense, put in a golden censer, and swung around and brought into that holy place, but um, it was prayers going up before God. And every morning and every evening, the priest would burn incense at the altar in the holy place. And David suggested, if you look it up in Psalm 141 verse 2, that may my prayers go up before you as incense. And so incense is always a picture of intercession and prayer before God. But also, to me, it, it reminds me that Jesus Christ is always interceding for me. He's, he's, his, he's praying for us. He's interceding for us. All throughout the New Testament, we've been studying that, that He is our intercessor. You want to read more about that? Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 33 and 34. So, Next, we come to the most holy place. We described, for the most part, the holy place. But in verse 3 and 4, it goes on to say, Behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot, which had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So here in the most holy place, matter of fact, I think I already told you about the censer. First, I just want to make sure you, do I have a picture of the censer? Yeah, real accurate, high def picture of the censer. No, actually, if it wasn't the, if it wasn't the, the altar itself, altar of incense, it would have been a censer. And most authors, as they study the altar of incense, it just seems to be so connected because coals would be transferred one way or another from the holy place to the most holy place. Now, of course, the object you really want to hear about is the Ark of the Covenant. That's the one we all saw in the movie, right? <laughs> Everybody, remember when the Indiana Jones gives an old movie now, but, but boy, oh boy, the, the way they portrayed that, the Ark of the Covenant. It stood inside the Holy of Holies, the holiest of all, and it was a chest made of acacia wood. It also was covered with gold, it was three and three quarter feet long, two and a quarter feet wide, two and a quarter feet high, and there were rings on the side of it uh, where poles can be inserted so that when the priest moved it, you don't touch the ark. You move it by carrying it with the poles, with the, the rings 
given. Now, inside the ark, there were some things mentioned here in these verses. There was a golden pot that had manna. Now, if you read about it in Exodus chapter 16, verse 33, we're told that God wanted the people to always remember his provision in the wilderness. And the, what did he do? If you know the story, he rained manna from heaven. And, and uh, it was called, actually in Hebrew, manna means what is it? <laughs> what is it? Don't you hate that, ladies, when you're feeding dinner and your husband says, what is it? <laughs> but this was something they've never seen before, but it was nutritional, it was good for them. So that's what sustained them all those years in the wilderness. Also in the ark was Adam's rod that budded. You could read about that in Numbers chapter 17. And there was the tablets of the covenant, which is the Ten Commandments. Okay. Now, if you study throughout the Old Testament, there were times certain things were there and certain things weren't because there was a couple times in the history of Israel where the ark was actually stolen or lost in battle when Israel made the mistake stupid thing to do is they bring it into battle thinking it's going to fight for them and and one time it was even captured by the Philistines okay so there were times uh, it was tampered with and of course God dealt with the Philistines when they looked in they had really bad problems in the end if you know what I'm talking about okay now the manna reminded Israel of God's provision and yet their ungratefulness because remember God provided the manna but they complained we're tired of this manna. We, we want something else. We want meat. You remember the story. And, and God gave them meat until it was coming out of their nostrils. Now, there's so many stories here. We're not going to be able to turn to them all, okay? But they, they were tired of the manna. And so it reminded, it was always a constant reminder of God's provision and yet the children of Israel's ungratefulness. In the ark, Aaron's rod that budded, you can read about it in number 17. It was a reminder of Israel's rebellion, actually, to, to God's authority. Because if you remember, there's a story where, where the other people wanted to lead, and Aaron, who is Aaron, and I, I should be the leader. And, and Moses collected each of their staffs and says, let's bring them before the Lord, and let's just see who should be the leader. And Aaron's rod, Aaron's staff, budded. And uh, that's just kind of special, overnight. And so God showed through that that Aaron was to be the leader. And there was a lot of other ways, uh, if you know the history of Israel, that God showed who's boss and who's not boss. But we'll just save it for this one for that because that was Aaron's rod that budded. I want you to know this because I'm going to explain how it all ties in in a moment. Then the tablets, the Ten Commandments. It actually reminded, it was a reminder of God's unmovable law and how God's people were unable to keep the law. They were unable to keep the Ten Commandments and of course, especially all of the law written. There's a whole lot more than just ten. So, now, the mercy seat. Let's talk about this for a second because it ties it all in together. The mercy seat was not a chair as you might picture. It was actually the lid of the ark. Now, you know, I'm using images I find off the web. I don't know. The, we, nobody really knows exactly how this looked like because we don't have it. No museum holds these things today, okay? But the mercy seat was the lid, and it was very ornate, and it was on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, and it was designed with cherubims or angels on top. And whenever the Day of Atonement came and the high priest would make sacrifice and he'd put the blood on top of the cover of the, uh, it was just once a year, on top of the mercy seat, a appropriately called mercy seat. Because as God looked down onto the ark, he saw the symbols of Israel's sin, breaking the Ten Commandments, the rebellion, Aaron's rod that budded, and so much of their failure. And when the blood was placed upon the mercy seat, God saw the blood, and the blood covered it all. The blood covered Israel's sin. Remember I told you before, in the Old Testament, atonement means covering. And all the blood of sacrifices could ever do back then was to cover sin. Not to completely remove it. But the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, Jesus, He doesn't just cover our sin. He takes away our sin. And so the mercy seat was a covering until the real deal could come, okay? It was a reenactment of what was yet to come, the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, 
in verse 5 we're told, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail now. Now, there's some things he didn't have to speak in detail because they knew the details of it. But there's other things, I think like maybe the cherubim. We don't know what the cherubim really looked like. Uh, I know one thing. I mean, I found an image there that I, you can't even make out what that is. It's just, we don't know what it looked like. i tell you what it wasn't. There's another picture here. Cherubims were not chubby babies. Have you ever seen that where people go, oh, the cherubim. It's like our guardian angels are just fat little babies with little wings, like hummingbirds flying around. That is not, I don't know where they got that from, but we don't know what the cherubim look like, but it's not that. Just to, just to clear things up, okay? Now, verse 6 goes on to say, now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But under the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, but not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now keep in mind, this high priest, the earthly high priest, he had to get a sacrifice for himself. As a matter of fact, it's funny, <coughs> if you'll study it, the, the sacrifice for the sins of all the people was one goat. Actually, there was two. There was a scapegoat that was released into the wilderness, and there's one goat that was sacrificed for the people. It's a long story. But the, the animal they had to sacrifice for the high priest was a bull. What does that tell you? He needed a little bit more. And so it was, he had to sacrifice a bull, and he was in and out of there on the Day of Atonement a couple times in order to first have himself cleansed, and then secondly, go in for the people. Now, something else that hits me in verse 7, it says, for the people's sins committed in ignorance. What about if I did it on purpose? Well, all throughout the year, uh, you know, there was, there was opportunity for sacrifice for sins and to make amends for sins. Lots of times sacrifices were, um, or excuse me, sins were punished. You know, uh, uh, capital crime, if you committed murder back in those days, they didn't have, well, we'll just do a little sacrifice for you. You committed murder, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That was the law, right? So it was tough back then. So some of these sins, there weren't sacrifices for. But when he talked about sins committed in ignorance, sins of ignorance, ignorance were the specific aim of the Day of Atonement. Because it was assumed that all known sin would have already been taken care of one way or another at the regular sacrifices or through direct punishment. But in case you missed anything, we're going to do it all on the Day of Atonement. It's a catch-all for all sin. Now, I want to tell you some details about the priest that you won't find in this text. But as I was studying and came to my attention, I thought, you've got to hear this. Because we're looking at pictures of Jesus. And the, the details are the priest, you know, the regular priest, not the high priest, entered the holy place daily. But only the high priest could enter the most holy place and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he entered with the blood of the atoning sacrifices, as I mentioned briefly already. And they were offered first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. And this annual sacrifice reveals really the, how imperfect and how temporary the Old Covenant was. It had to be done over and over again, it had to be done continually today as Christians. Jesus shed his blood for us once for all. And we find ourselves in sin. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It was done once, and that sacrifice was so holy, so sacred, so special that it covers it all. And you ever sinned? If you ever sin again, you bring it to him. And it's, it's put under the blood of Jesus Christ. Wonderful thing. Now back in the old covenant, there's just one man could enter God's presence. Just a high priest. And, and that highly privileged man couldn't go in whenever he wanted. Once a year on the Day of Atonement. It was a very time limited thing, you know. And, and it had to be done annually. And this sacrifice was both imperfect and impermanent. It wasn't per, a permanent thing. And all this shows the, the superficiality of the Old Testament. <clears throat> that it was just a picture and it could never really totally cleanse and purify man from his sin. 
It could never restore fallen man to his, his, the glory he should have until the new covenant. The new covenant, we could be born again. We've talked about that before. I've shown you the advantage of the new covenant is God gives us a new nature and causes us to be born again. And it's not just going through the rituals, going through the motions over and over again. So in verse 6 when it says, <clears throat> when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first place of the tabernacle performing the services. Every day, every day, twice a day, these, these priests would go in. They'd have a morning and evening sacrifice. And what, what would they do in there? Well, when they'd go into the sanctuary, the, the average priest, not the high priest, would go in. He'd trim the oil to keep those lamps burning. He would put incense on the altar of incense, make sure that they never ran out, the, that the incense was always burning. And he would go in and Sabbath, he would change the 12 loaves every Sabbath. And it was all a picture of Jesus Christ continually maintaining our way into the presence of God. He's the bread of life. He feeds us. He's the light of the world. He, he, he's always interceding. The altar of incense, he's always interceding on our behalf. So it was all images and pictures of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 7, the second half says, but under the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now, there's few things in the Bible that picture Jesus Christ like this, like the Day of Atonement, okay? As a matter of fact, is that one of my fill-ins? Okay, your next fill-in. The Day of Atonement is a perfect picture of Christ. And so we're going to look at some of this today. And you know what? Uh, I, I have Jewish friends, Messianic Jews, who... A matter of fact, one guy, Cyril Gordon, who's one of the missionaries in California we support, he wants to come out and do a Passover Seder for us so that we can see more pictures. There's so much more that, he, that I couldn't grasp at all. He, he's, he's got a great presentation. So if it all works out, maybe we'll have him come out sometime. But listen, the priest, the, the, excuse me, the author of Hebrews doesn't give all the details because the average Jewish believer at that time knew what they needed to know. But the Day of Atonement, like I said, it was a catch-all to make sure all the sins were covered in case any sins were unconfessed or not atoned for. Uh, they'd all be covered once a year in case I missed anything this year on the Day of Atonement, and it was for the whole nation. Because, you know, sin severs our relationship with God. Sin separates us from God. What's the, that's what the Bible says. An owning sacrifice, owning bloodshed, can bring forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there is no remission of sin. That's both Old and New Testament thinking, okay? Only, uh, the only way we could get forgiveness is through sacrifice. And so that was the Day of Atonement. So we're going to look at some of the details here. Very early in the morning, the high priest would get up out of bed, and he'd cleanse himself through ceremonial washings. And he'd wash himself thoroughly, and he'd put on these gorgeous robes that were specifically made for the Day of Atonement. And, and they were robes of glory, uh, robes of beauty, fancy, fancy robes. And then there was the ephod, the robe of the ephod he'd put on. And I think I have a, a picture of that. Oh, you could look at a lot of things there if you could read all that. Okay, so the robe of ephod, and I, if you could, I don't know how well you could see it from where you're sitting, but on the robe of the ephod, the shoulders, on each shoulder, there were a large onyx stone. And on the, each onyx stone, there were six names of the tribes of Israel. So each, the, both of the shoulders added up to the 12 tribes of Israel, the names of the tribes of Israel. And then on the breastplate that he wore, there were 12 precious stones on that breastplate. And each one of them represented one of the tribes of Israel, just before God, before his presence. The high priest was going before God on behalf of the people. Please remember Israel. Remember the tribes. Remember your promises, both on his shoulders and on his heart, over his heart. What a picture of Jesus Christ, that when he goes before God the Father on our behalf, he's carrying us on his heart because he cares for us and loves us. And also, not just his heart, but on his shoulders because he's able to bear us. Okay? And so what a, what a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. That was a picture of Jesus who would someday, of course in the tabernacle day, it was Old Testament, but he would come and he'd not only be able, but he'd be willing 
to bear us before the Father. And so on that day, the high priest cleaned up, and he put on his robes, and he began to do his daily sacrifices. And um, I read in one commentator, it says that by the time the, the high priest went into the actual holy place, he probably could have done as many as 22 animal sacrifices. And so he went through all these sacrifices, and when he was done with that work, he would remove the gorgeous robes that were made, those special robes that I'm showing you a picture of there. And he would take off the robes of glory and beauty. And he went again and bathed himself and washed from top to bottom. And when he was completely clean, he'd then put on a pure white linen with no decoration, nothing fancy, just pure white linen. Now, the best picture I could find is that, so forgive me if, if that doesn't quite do it. But I want you to see that it would total change from that ornate, gorgeous robe to just pure, plain, but pure. Plain, nothing special, nothing fancy, but it was also a symbol of holiness, a symbol of purity. So here's your next fill-in that goes along with this. This is a perfect symbol of Jesus Christ, who in the work of atonement stripped off all his glory and all his beauty and became the humblest of humble, and he dressed in the simplest linen of human flesh. I like that, because it was, it was, again, a type, an image, a shadow of the high priest now taking off his robes of glory and putting on plain robes of flesh like, like Jesus did. That The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, keep in mind, it's still white. I mean, it's plain, but it's white. In all of his humility, he never lost his holiness. And so when Jesus came to do the work of the sacrifice and to make atonement for sin, he took off the glory, but he never took off the purity. He never took off the holiness. And so again, this is a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. When the high priest was done with all the sacrifice of atonement, then he put back on his robes of glory just like Jesus did. You see, the Bible tells us that after Jesus finished his work, as a matter of fact, even before it all began, in John 17, he prayed, Oh, Father, you know, I'm going to do the work that you've called me to do, but then would you restore me to the glory I had with you before all time? And so your next feeling is this. <clears throat> after his humble work of atoning sacrifice, Christ returned to heaven adorned with glory, that's our Jesus. All right, verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this, this is the way into, excuse me, start over. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. What we're being told here is there's no way to get before God without a high priest. There's no way to get to God without a Savior, without Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The old covenant was limited and temporary, but it was a beautiful picture. Matter of fact, in your shepherd or sheep, I said it was just shadows, but it was sacred shadows. That's why I call today's message sacred shadows. Now you think I don't have time, but we're just going to read. With, now that you know what you know, we're going to finish out the next few verses. We're not going to do the whole chapter today. But now that you know what you've, you've just heard and understood, process that as we read verse the rest of the verses. Verse 9 says, <clears throat> it was symbolic, that's the word parabolic, or excuse me, parabole, uh, for the present time which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the services perfect in regard to conscience. Concerning only with food and drink and various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. That word reformation could be restoration. So what what the Holy Spirit is saying is all that time there were symbols and pictures and rituals and don't eat this and don't eat that and don't do this and don't do and uh, there's dietary laws there's all these laws but it was all temporary just images and pictures until the time of reformation or the time of restoration or the time Jesus came because verse 11 says this but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. You looking forward to going to the temple? 
we will in heaven. There's not a holy place on earth that now that since 70 AD, it's gone. Okay? It's not needed anymore. Verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling, um, <clears throat> sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies and purifies the flesh, how much more, look at verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. <clears throat> There's one more verse here, but listen, I don't want you to miss this. I underlined in my Bible, cleanse your conscience from dead works. How do we always try to make God happy? I got to do something. I got to do something to make God happy. I got to go through the motions, jump through the hoops, do the commandments, follow the ordinances of the church. There's, that's what cults like to do. <clears throat> they get you jumping through the hoops. They get you trying to do dead works. Something to try to please God. And, and here we're told that the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit working in your life will cleanse your conscience from dead works. But don't stop there to serve the living God. Oh, he wants you to serve him. But not out of guilt and trying to make him happy and try to, how can I please him? How can I appease him? I like the combination of words in this verse. We're to be cleansed from the dead works so that we can have a living service unto God. Now we live for God. We serve Him. You don't stop serving. It's not, well, now you don't have to serve Him. No, it's the dead works we get rid of. Now that you're alive in Christ and you've received the light of life, now you serve Him. From dead works to service. See it there in verse 14. One more verse, we're done. Verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Remember I told you that one of the main differences between the promises of the old covenant and the promises of the new covenant, the promises of the old covenant, the focus of the old covenant was the promised land and being blessed in this life. Oh, your crops will be blessed, and your wheat will be blessed, and your offspring will be blessed, and you'll get into the promised land. It was all about the promised land. The better promises of the better covenant that we have is all about eternal life. It's, the, it's not this life. So don't worry, you're not getting ripped off. We're all going through bumps in this world, okay? This is temporary. Our promises, our glory is yet to come in the new life, in the eternal life. That's what we're waiting for, folks. I tell you what, I promise you one thing. If I happen to run into you in heaven, and I say, oh, remember how, remember how bad you had? Remember when that bad thing happened to you? You'll say, shh, look at this. Forget about it. When we get to heaven, all the former, former shadows will be forgotten. Because we'll have the real deal. We'll see the real God. we the real Savior. we the one true high priest. And our rewards will be eternal in the heavens. It'll be a wonderful thing. I'm looking forward to the day. Father, we bow before you. We thank you for your word today that once more reminded us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Get our eyes off of this world because this world stinks. Lord, we look to you. <clears throat> we look forward to those eternal promises. We look forward to the day when we can see you face to face. And Lord, thank you for all the images and the shadows, even as dim as they were, but they show us Jesus of the New Testament. And now we can see clearly, now that we have our New Testament. Thank you, Lord. And Father, I pray that if there's anybody here in our midst right now who's not right with you, <clears throat> who isn't prepared to stand before you, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to cross over from death to life. If that's you and you know it, if I'm describing you and you're not in a good place right now with God and you know it, <clears throat> just call upon the Lord. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The door is not barred. It's not like the old tabernacle that nobody could go in except the priest. The door is open to you. 
And Jesus holds his arms out wide and says, Come to me. Come to me that you might have life. So would you do that right now? If you're not right with God, just confess your sins. And if you've never done that, <clears throat> if you've never been right with God, just say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me yours. I put my trust in you as my Lord and as my Savior. I surrender my life to you I'm yours and you're mine. Hear my cry in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's